Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So, guys, truly there is nothing new under the sun. And we see history repeating itself time and time again. And, you know, what we might take for something new, it, often, and perhaps most of the time, it's a rehash of something that has gone before. A retelling of the same story with just basically new names. That's really it. But, you know, there are deeper insights into these stories as well. So when we look at these things, look at, you know, for instance, some of these well-known uh, symbols, we see obviously a Statue of Liberty, and then we also see, uh, I forget which studio is that, is that Universal or Columbia? I think, Colum I think it is Columbia, y yeah. And you see this again, which is a reference to the Statue of Liberty perhaps, or perhaps something far more ancient going down through time. You know, so much of what we take as literal history is perhaps a mix of some history along with astrotheology. And there are many people that view that everything is astral theology and it's just all allegory. Uh, perhaps there's, you know, things mixed in and it's, it's a synthesis of many different things. So there's something called the procession of the equinoxes, and you might refer to them as different ages. So, you know, the age of Aquarius is supposed to be dawning now. What was before that was the age of um, Pisces here. And uh, the age of Pisces is, you know, you can look at it as the age of the rise of monotheism, and its symbol was the fish. In the age of Aquarius, you see its its symbol is, is like this waves, signifying water. And we see the age of Aries went before that. And so that was around 2150 B.C. It's, it's arguable, but it, roughly in that era and ends around the time of Christ, which begins the age of Pisces. And, you know, the Christian symbol, one of them is the fish, which makes a lot of sense because it's initiating in a new age, a new era. And when we see Aries, it's signified by the ram. What went before that? The age of the bull, the age of Taurus, which gave us uh, agriculture and, and a lot of our societies were starting to be perhaps reestablished after cataclysms. And then it goes into other ages that have gone before it, such as Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and basically the rest of the Zodiac. So, so much of what we see is based on that. And again, the, it, it's all related to the procession of the equinoxes. And, and a lot of you guys might not have realized that Polaris, which is our current North Star, it won't be our North Star come about 14,000 AD. That will be Vega. So things change also because of the wobble of the Earth as the Earth goes through its great movement. So the ancient Roman cult that has its origins most likely in Persia, and it continues to vex scholars, the Mithraic Mysteries, and they worshiped a pagan god from the subterranean temples buried throughout the empire. Interesting. Their temples were under the earth. Think of all the symbolism that we always see. Right. And we had talked about the fact that there's many dying and resurrection gods and that that is a reference again to the sun, which gives us life. Without the sun, we wouldn't be here. The sun is the life bringer. It's also the light bringer, too. And so the symbolism that we see over and over with this cult is this man slaughtering a bull. Well, you know, somebody that's familiar with astrotheology and procession of the equinoxes, it's kind of obvious that they're slaughtering the age of Taurus. And again, when we looked at the different ages, uh, the age of Taurus was between 4300 B.C. to 2150 B.C. Most of um, our biblical era that we look at with the patriarchs, you know, is all going to be uh, from about 2000 B.C. going forward. So it's interesting to see that. Now, the age of Aries, I want to note, you know, it was basically, well, a Aries is the god of war, right? Aries is Mars, if we equate the uh, 
you know, the Greek and the Roman systems, and it's the age of war, fire and the ram. So interesting to make note of these things as we look at these ancient things, uh, which perhaps are still being played out right now, these ancient rituals, ancient drama that's still ongoing. So Mithraism was an underground literally, <laughs> Roman religious group that worshipped a pagan deity called Mithras. All Mithrae featured a Tocteronomy, which is an image of the god Mithras slaying the sacred bull as its centerpiece. So th though the covert religion was once so widespread that some historians considered it an early rival and sister religion to Christianity, Little is actually known for certain about it now. We could put the pieces together. And, you know, again, it comes into uh, popular acceptance right around the time of Christ in the first century. And it, it was strong. And then it disappears right around 400 AD as the Constantinian version of Christianity takes hold and starts to wipe out the traces of everything that went before it from which it got its symbolism and it got its ideology and mysteries. So that shows you right there that this is uh, an important piece in understanding where things came from. As what Constantine did was Constantine synthesized many different aspects of many different philosophies, created one that would satisfy the people and also bind them into one unified system under his control, where he would control them through his politics, well, and also the fact that he would control them through their religion, and that makes for total control. So it, it's fascinating to see this. Now, you know, of course, with Christ, he died, and then three days later was resurrected. Interesting how all their uh, ceremonies were done underground. The underworld, obviously symbolic of where we go after death. And so there was different levels, seven levels. Now, if you know numerology, seven is a divine number. And you see there's different grades. And there's lesser mysteries and then the greater mysteries. And they are associated with different planets. Interesting how the greatest mystery is associated with Saturn. Saturn is Kronos, as we know as well. Father Time, which was a titan, which was, you know, slaughtered uh, by Zeus, king of the gods, which was, you know, again, another one of these divine dramas that has a lot more than just one meaning. And you see the associated constellations. It's just fascinating to see how this stuff plays out time and time again. So, this is the Mithraic Kronos, the Aeon, right? And it's interesting to see you have kind of a lionish head on a he on a man's body wrapped with snakes with angel wings. Isn't that curious? And again, you know, there's so much symbology. This was uh, from 190 AD that this statue was made. And the body was entwined six times by a serpent head which rests on the skull of the god, four wings decorated with the symbols of the seasons issued from the back. Each hand holds a key, and then the right, in addition, a long scepter, the symbol of authority. A thunderbolt is engraved on the breast. On the base of the statue may be seen the hammer and tongs of Vulcan, the cock and pine cone consecrated to Asclepius, or possibly to the sun and Attis and the wand of mercury so interesting how you have basically he is the embodiment of the powers of all the gods sorry for the noise in the background guys and again there's there are so many similarities between Addis again and the Christian mythology and symbolism here again you see a lion-headed god standing on the globe with cross circles so you know is Christ. Christ uh, was referenced as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Isn't that interesting as well? Very curious how all these things tie together. And here you see an entrance going into a Mithraeum, 
Very, very mysterious. So when we look at th some items as far as the practice of Mithraism. Now, history of Mithras, Mithra was originally a Persian sun god. Or maybe, maybe not exactly. You know, again, they like to throw doubt into these things. So sometimes he's equated with the sun, sometimes higher or lower in rank, dating back to around 600 BC, if not earlier. And in fact, there are those that say that 600 should be 6,000 BC. That's quite a bit of difference. What we see is that the official doctrines, which again, all stem from the official doctrines of Constantine the Great, starting in 325 AD, with his consolidation of power, informed the Roman Catholic Church with their doctrine and their Nicene Creed. That's where you get it from, the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed. Uh, which, as a young Catholic boy, I recited so many times, not really understanding it at first, but I was going to make sure I did. And so, as I delved deeper, I w no longer became Catholic and ended up shedding everything, ultimately, there. And, you know, it's just fascinating to see these things. There's always more ancient roots, always more ancient roots. And then they try to wipe out every trace of those ancient roots as well. So, it, it really could be as, as far back as 6000 BC. Mentions of the god are found in both the Vedas and the Avesta, Hindu and Persian sacred texts. He became associated with the Chaldean astrology. And again, right there, w w the wise men that go visit Christ, they came from the east. Some think they were Chaldean, some think they were Persian, some think they were from the Indus Valley. So, in, very interesting, because that's the mother area of the wisdom. So, the worship of Marduk, perhaps? And then finally came in contact with the Western world through Alexander's conquests. And I would venture something different. The diaspora and the taking of the Jews into captivity as well. So, Mithraism spread rapidly through the Greek Empire and was well known by 100 BC. So, we, it is predating the time of Christ by at least 100 years there in Greece. So this is more ancient and it becomes very clear where things come. You now, it gives you a for example. For example, fasting is first imposed upon the neophytes, those being indoctrinated into this mystery school because it is a mystery school. And we know mystery schools con control this world. So it's fasting is imposed upon the neophytes for a period of about 50 days if it's successfully endured. In other words, if you don't die, or you end up giving up. For two days, they are then exposed to extreme heat and then again plunged into snow for 20 days. And thus, the severity of the discipline is gradually increased. And if the postulant shows himself capable of endurance, he is finally admitted into the highest grades. Several Roman emperors built temples to Mithra and put his face on coins. His popularity increased until the laws of Theodosius outlawed the worship of Mithra with a death penalty, by the way, at in the end of the 4th century. But did it really disappear, or was it just changing forms, just like the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire went from an outward empire to basically, you know, its, its central authority power became the Catholic Church. Mithraic doctrine, influenced by Zoroastrianism, which is a Persian religion, which when you look at the belief system of the Jews before their exile in Persia and after, it changes totally because of the influence of Zoroastrianism. Before, their, before they were um, basically in exile there, they didn't have that messianic line of thinking like they do after. And then everything becomes much more a uh, case of the light against the darkness. So Mithraic cosmology is conceived of as a battle between the light, Ahura Mazda, and the darkness, Aryaman. In prehistory, the evil forces rose up to overthrow the good forces. However, they were beaten and thrown into hell. They escaped and find refuge on earth where they wander and afflict man. He was born fully grown out of a rock or a cave in some traditions. Thus, uh, thus his name, the God of the Rock, Mithra is the mediator between man and God. And so Christ is the mediator between man and God. Mithraics believe that through him and through certain ritualistic processes in this life, they will achieve immortality. 
Mithra will come again at the end of the world and thus prove himself never conquered. Very similar, isn't it not, to the second coming? Mithraism was a mystery re religion, a religion that taught its truth in several different stages and only revealed wisdom when the initiate was prepared for it. Christ taught in parables to the masses, and the mysteries were openly discussed amongst the inner sanctum as well. There are several references to the markings of Mithras. Initiates seem to get a cross tattooed on their foreheads. Revelation 22, you know, the, those that are marked by the Lamb get his name on their foreheads. Interesting, is it not? And so, the cross was the symbol of the sun and also the shape of the sword. Initiates had to prove themselves masters over their physical passions through fasting and ordeals. It also appeared they were vegetarians. They believed in reincarnation, transmigration of the soul, and so refrained from killing any animal, much like modern Bo Buddhists. Fascinating how some things you know, are, are indoctrinated and drawn into a new system and others are omitted. So, hundreds of years uh, before Jesus, according to the Mithraic religion, three wise men of Persia came to visit the baby savior god Mithra, bringing with them gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense. And we've heard that before. Mithra was born on December 25th, as told in the great religions of the world. It was the winter solstice celebrated by the ancients as the birthday of Mithraism's sun god, because that's where things reverse and instead of the sun growing dimmer and weaker it turns and starts to grow stronger again as we pass through winter and start to head towards the months of prosperity and warmth according to mithraism before mithra died on a cross he celebrated a last supper with his 12 disciples who represented the 12 signs of the zodiac see there's always allegory there's 12 months of the year as well and we could go on and on and on with the twelve. After the death of Mithra, his body was laid to rest in a rock tomb. He had a celibate priesthood. He ascended to heaven during the spring equinox, the sign when the sun crosses the equator, making day and night of equal length. So obviously, you know, so much of this is incorporated into modern Christianity. Again, born on December 25th, you know, died, put in a tomb, it resurrected. It's also very clear and obvious. The Twelve disciples, star came in the east. And it's not just him. There's so much more. And Zoroastrianism, from which all this comes, is one of the world's oldest religions. As we said, specula speculation ranges that it could be as much as 6,000 B.C. B.C. So 8,000 years old. And again, what do we have as far as te Hebrew texts in writing? We have bits and pieces. And they are at the very oldest, 200 B.C. to 200 A.D. So you, you could see this time and time again. The dualism, God and the devil, Satan, Satan's Ariman. And, you know, God is a Hura Mazda, heaven and hell. It has all this, born of a virgin, final judgment, second coming, nothing new. It's all the same rehash. And what years were the Jews in the Persian exile? 372 BCE to 348 BCE. And so we see with the um, books of the prophets uh, that were very, very much in line with this. When we look at like Isaiah and Daniel and Joel, uh, you you see that type of that type of vibe that type of feel that so Zoroastrianism in it. So I hope you guys found this informative. As always, I want to thank you so much for your support on uh, Ko-Fi and also on Patreon. Uh, without that, we wouldn't be able to keep going. And thank you so much as always, guys. Much love. God bless and Namaste.